I try to analyze whether the armed conflict uh, escalated to an international armed conflict because of the role of South Africa, because of the role of Super Zapu. Because remember that Super Zapu was set up, supported, deployed, trained, and, and, and uh, uh, incubated by South Africa. So the involvement of another country in a conflict, whether in the territory of another or in the territory of a separate country, makes that in conflict international. A conflict with only one country fighting rebels or armed groups is, a is, an, is an internal armed conflict. It becomes international if there's another state involved. So I analyzed whether the role of South Africa, the apartheid regime, uh, turned that conflict into an international one. I came to the conclusion applying the requirements of effective control, overall control, which have been applied by the courts, Yugoslavia, Rwanda, and more recently uh, ICC in relation to the conflict in, 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 in the east of the Congo, where, and the, and the funny thing is that the, the, the International Criminal Court has, has been reluctant to find <laughs> international involvement by Rwanda and Uganda, even though they have found this evidence of support, military contribution, they failed to conclude that these countries are operationally deciding the targets or they are deciding the strategies. But I came to the similar conclusion that the role of South Africa, while it was there and evident in, in creating Super Zapu, deploying it, I didn't find evidence. I'm not saying it's not there. I'm saying that this is probably something other scholars can can delve deeper into. I didn't devote too much time to it. I, I mean, I did, but but I, I couldn't find the information. And I guess if one goes into declassified, declassified intelligence material and defense material, since now the apartheid is gone, the regime, one might find this. I didn't find that there was operational engagement by the, the Boer... Uh, um, uh, government on where attack here, do this, do that. I didn't find that. And, and of course, Super Zapu came quickly and went quickly, if you remember. So that's the first finding. The second was, I looked at the very much debated question of genocide. You know, people say, was, was Gokurawande genocide uh, or not? And people are quick to say, no, 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 it wasn't a genocide because uh, it was political. You know, it was Zapu. Uh, it was it was Zapu that was uh, being destroyed, and uh, some people say no. It's only a genocide is only if all the tribe uh, go and attack another tribe. People don't understand what genocide is. So what I did was I looked at the requirements for genocide under international law, and I reviewed those requirements and I analyzed them. I I looked at the Kukuraundi, the context carefully, and I came to the conclusion that Kukuraundi was a genocide, and I substantiate my my conclusions and my findings accordingly and they are really the first big step in determining whether something is a genocide you know a genocide simply put is a i spoke about this at the last uh, uh, when you invited me as a speaker at the uh, festival uh, so i'm not going to belabor the point uh, but really genocide is the destruction of uh, either national ethnic, racial, or religious group, destruction in whole or in part. You don't have to destroy everybody. You can destroy some people. Uh, uh, and and, and that's, the, that's what genocide is. It's the destruction in whole or in part of, of a, a, a group based on its identity. And there's four protected identities. So I had to then analyze uh, who are the protected identities in the context of Kukraundi? And my conclusion was that it was Ndebeles. How did I reach this conclusion uh, that it was Ndebeles who were the victims of genocide by the Kukraundi? And how do I factor in the Zapu factor in that analysis and finding? I said, okay, what is clear uh, is that, you know, you don't need a reason to commit genocide, by the way. You don't need a motive. Uh, genocide is just the intent to destroy a group, racial, religious, ethnic, and uh, national. You don't need to hate them. <laughs> you don't need to, you may just want to cleanse, uh, have purity in your society. You may 
you may you may hate them, you may whatever the reason. But anyway, the long and the short is that I I then had to look is there a because then do do the Ndebeles fall into any of these four protected groups? Are they a national group? Are they an ethnic group? Are they racial? They're definitely not a religious group. They're definitely not an ethnic group, a racial group. They're not a national group. I then analyzed the ethnic and I found that they are. You can go anywhere, you can look at Beach, you can look at the historians, you can look at Terence Ranger, you can look at the writings of Sabelo Kacheni, Muzondizia. There, there is zero question and debate that the Develes are considered a separate ethnic group in Zimbabwe. Yes, it has subsects in it, and there's a broad uh, church of ethnic groups, including Soto and so on, but there is no question that there's a distinct language, distinct history, distinct heritage, distinct geographical area uh, that distinguishes Ndebeles, even have a language uh, as well. They don't need to, because in Rwanda, for example, the Tutsi spoke the same language as the Hutus. I don't know if people <laughs> know this, but they were still distinguished as an ethnic group. There are many ways in which people distinguish each other as ethnic as an ethnic groups. So it's not just the language. So you can speak the same language, but with different ethnic groups. That's, that's possible. The language is not the, the ultimate determinant factor. So I concluded, and, 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 and it's all there, how I, fi I reached that finding, that, that Ndebeles are a, an ethnic group. And nobody will argue about that, I think. Uh, I know people say it's a collection of groups, but now, having determined that, I said, so how do you connect uh, this to the genocide? Uh, and my conclusion was that it was very clear from 1980, 1980 the elections, that uh, post-election, ZANU-PF won that election, but ZANU-PF was very sore about the loss of Matebele land. You just follow all the speeches uh, of senior ZANU politicians. Zobo is one of them. One of the most poignant uh, speeches Zobo made was that uh, they had anticipated all along that the white people would struggle to lose power. What they never anticipated was that the villagers would find it hard to accept Mugabe as their leader. This is 1980. Already you see the discourse where it's headed. It's Ndebeles don't want Mugabe. <laughs> right? It's not, it's not Zapu doesn't want Mugabe. It's Ndebeles. I mean, you begin to have this very rabid, rabid incitement, very ethnic uh, tones in the politics. It was there before even in the struggle, as you know. I think your last uh, breakfast, uh, I can't remember who you were talking to, who talked about this, the, 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 the clashes between Debele and Shona. But also the, you begin to have Mugabe characterizing Zapu as a, as a Debele party, you know, when in fact Zapu was anything but a Debele party. You know, Nkomo was called Father Zimbabwe, but the top, the top five of Zapu were all Linguistically speaking, they were all Shonas. You remember? I mean, people forget that Parrenyatwa, the father of the David Parrenyatwa, the one who, who's the, the, the first medical black doctor here, they forget that when he died at Hini Junction there, he was the vice president of Zapu. But David Parrenyatwa, you know, the, the Samuel Parrenyatwa, sorry, the father of, of, of David Parrenyatwa, he was Zapu. Chikerema, all Zapu. Nyandoro, all Zapu. I mean, Zapu, and the people forget as well that the, the rallies that Zapu called in Highfields, how many thousands of people were there? Yeah, yeah. People forget that Zapu had structures in Mashonaland, Manikaland, Midlands, and these structures were emptied out in the run-up to the 1980 election. Remember, the 1980 election was very violent. Yeah. People forget this. They don't talk about the 1980 election as violent. And the purpose of the violence using Zandla combatants that were deployed to, to run the campaign was to empty out the Zapu support in the rest of the country. And it succeeded because the rest of the country Zapu got no votes. And I mean, we have so many people who were staunch and they still say, uh, you know, whether it's Kutu, uh, it's, it's uh, Pindura, who say, I'm Zapu, I've always been Zapu. But then what then was left is that when the election results came out in 1980, the place that was protected from the violence of 1980 was Matebele land. That's why Zapu got all its 20 seats. Because, in, because all the zebra competence were in the 
camps here. There's no way Zander was going to come and do its nonsense here as well because it was going to be a civil war straight away. So they did their nonsense everywhere else around the country. And they didn't do it here. And the results showed that, right? Because the people of Matebele went to vote and they, and they voted Zapu. And had the violence not happened, I'm positive Zapu would have done better around the country as well. But anyway, long and short, is that this pattern, when they look at it, when Zanu looks at it, and, and Zopo and Mugabe and the Central Committee, they realize that we've got the whole country now, except Matebele land. So Kukuraundi was, let me give you an analogy. You remember Operation Mavotera Papi? Yeah. Kukuraundi was the first Operation Mavotera Papi. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? Do you see the analogy? Yeah. Kukuraundi was the first Operation Mavotera Papi. Like, okay, so we see what you've done. And Mugabe speaks about this. We don't differentiate between dissidents and supporters. We want to crush the snake, the head and its tail and its people. So he conflates everything. And mind you, who is in Matebele land? Matebele supporters of Zapu. And so, and, he, and they start speaking that language. Ndebeles, the people of Matebele need to be reoriented. Who are the people of Matebele land? It's interesting that on this day, actually, 1984, this is where uh, the, Nangagwa then was the Minister of uh, Justice. Uh, no, he was the Minister of Security. He says uh, uh, the, the collaborators of uh, dissidents will have their days shortened. Uh, you know, a speech he, re he, he repeated uh, a few yes, weeks I heard ago. That, yes, yes, yeah, so yes. uh, the language then was very uh, exactly the same. So. It was hate speech. It was hate language. But the decision had been made that we we need to deal with this region and the people of this region. So we need to deal with Zapu. But how are we going to deal with Zapu? We are going to cut Zapu's support base. We are going to go and turn them into our people. We're going to beat them. We'll torture them. We'll kill them into submitting. And that's why you see, if, if you want to understand it, look at the, 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 the rhetoric as you approach 1985. Mugabe goes, comes to Matebele and says, the people of Matebele will decide, will they choose to live or will they choose to die? I mean, what are you saying? <laughs> this is eight, 1985, two years into Kukraundi, you know, and, and what do you see? You see a, a rise in abductions of Zapo officials, district officials in Cholocho. You, you, so you look, at the, you look at the pattern, you see an increase in beatings, in torture. It's all politicized, but it's also very, very, very ethnicized. So, so I'll move on quickly. So I draw that conclusion and I substantiate my findings for it and I'm happy to engage people, but not, 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 on, not on issues that are not factual or legal or substantiated. I mean, if people want to debate, let's debate, but bring counter arguments, right? And not emotional anger or blackmail or whatever it is, that doesn't work. So the next thing that I look at, um, having concluded that um, uh, you know, the Kukraundi was a genocide. I then look at whether the Kukraundi were crimes against humanity. And crimes against humanity are different from genocide. Crimes against humanity, remember I said genocide, you need to intend to destroy in hollow in part a group, a protected group. I told you the four groups. Yeah. It's a it's a it's an identity crime, Kukraun. I mean genocide. Special crime, special intent. You must intend to, to, to kill or destroy that group. For crimes against, against humanity is very, very different. There is no identity. Uh, crimes against humanity uh, can be committed during peacetime or during wartime. Genocide also during peacetime and during wartime. I've already discussed war crimes. Um, so you can have uh, crimes against humanity when there's no war, war. But with crimes against humanity, the requirement is that there is a widespread or systematic attack against civilians um, as part of a state or organizational policy. 
That's the simple definition of crimes against humanity. A widespread systematic attack or systematic attack. No, it's not end, it's all. Systematic attack, so it can be systematic and not widespread. <laughs> it can be widespread and not systematic. So if people just go without any system and just kill people around the, the region or place, it can be crimes, even if there's no systematic way of doing it. But if it's both, it's even better. If it's widespread and systematic, then you know you are closer to proving that it has happened. And I, I, uh, I, I drew the conclusion that, I mean, even as I describe it, I say it, you can see, right? Was Kukura only widespread? It was. Uh, there's no village in Cholocho that was spared. They landed in January, late January, and they went village by village by village by village by village by village. They never spared a single village. They then moved to Kezi, village by village by village by village. They used Balagwe. They were putting people in stops camp. They were taking people from everywhere and taking them, Gwanda, taking them to stops camp. It was a, a system. It was planned. You had CIO involved. You had police intelligence services unit involved. You had everything there. And you had updates by the Minister of Security, Minister of Defense, Sekaramai, Minister of Security, Mnangagwa, Mukabe himself. So there is no question. You have the deployment of a brigade. It's replenished, logistically supported by one brigade there. All the other units are supporting it. It's a, it's a, it's a systematic plan. The state policy. There's a policy by the state. And the policy of the state, you can tell from 1980 when Mugabe announces that they're going to train a brigade. Even before their dissidents. You remember that the, the, remember that the decision was, was, was made before there were dissidents, yeah. Yeah. which meant that there was already a plan, and the result the reason was the elections. The reason were elections, not, not the dissidents, right the, when they looked at the results. But anyway, so, so, so I conclude that the attacks were widespread. They, clear, they, they definitely were. They were uniform, repetitious, consistent. Um, targeting the same civilian population over a long period of time. There is no question when you analyze it and you look at the requirements of the law, including some of the jurisprudence of the international tribunals as well as the International Criminal Court, that it meets the requirements for a widespread or systematic attack against the civilian population committed as part of a state or organizational policy. There was an organizational policy. The one-party state agenda was the policy. It was implemented through Kukuraundi, a military action effort, targeting an ethnic support base of a political party. So when you want to say it in one sentence, you begin to see, ah, okay, this is what it is. So a crime can be both a genocide and a crime against humanity so it doesn't have to be one or the other and i found that it was crimes against humanity as well as a genocide uh what happened the kukuraundi and and I, I i substantiate my my own analysis in so many different ways this is also in the paper that i wrote in the chapter in the book i think i shared it with you uh, that was published in january called unpacking unpacking the kukuraundi uh crimes um so Oh, yeah, I'll stop there on Kukraundi. The next thing, I guess, um, is what, what then do you do? I don't know, maybe that's part of your question. Yeah, maybe I should well, stop there. Yeah. I should stop there and let you ask, ask your next question. What I was going to ask you was, okay, we have heard about this, and people always talk about, we know Kukraundi does not fall under the ICC, and, is, and the, the people have been talking that it's been years and so forth. It, what is the solution? for victims? Do they have remedy at international law? Yeah, it's a good question. Look, okay, uh, the solution now comes from your characterization of what has happened, right? So, what's the solution if you commit a crime against, uh, if, you, if you rape uh, Jane, what's the solution? You go to jail, you get arrested. Uh, right, so once we have decided rape is a crime, we we don't debate should we go to the national truth and reconciliation should the NPRC look at the rape of Jane by Zenzele should so for me the, the the reason why I undertook this 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 initiative was to 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 make it easier to dis, to determine what needs to be done 
Right now, the discourse on Gokaraundi has always been resolving. What are we resolving when we are not sure <laughs> what it was? Right? Every day you've been talking to people, they come, I see you interviewing people, they were raped, their arms were chopped, that Joyce, uh, that uh, um, uh, woman from Cholocho uh, who suffered uh, terribly and for 30, 40 years she's been suffering. You look at her, you realize, my goodness. So this is the aftermath of Kukraundi. But at the heart of her story is a crime, right? I mean, a crime was committed against this woman by somebody. <laughs> <laughs> so the question is, is what is to be done to Joyce? I mean, a leg for Joyce is not the solution. Yes, she needs a leg because she's walking on a wooden stump and she's got no arm. She's got children she can't look after. There are things that need to be done to improve her life, right? And also to apologize to her. But more importantly, a crime has been committed on this woman. And the law is clear. Our national law is clear about crimes. I mean, we see the police running around, wasungwa, wasungwa, <laughs> because you've committed a crime, right? So, now let's talk about Gukraundi. Once we decide it was a genocide, which is an international crime, once we decide it was crimes against humanity, which is an international crime, once we decide it was a war crime, which is an international crime, what does international law say about those international crimes? Forget the NPRC. NPRC has no room around international crimes, right? What does, we can then debate what else could be done, but that for me is where I'm approaching it. I'm an international criminal lawyer, so I'm refusing to get into the politics of it. I'm going into the legal aspects of the issue. What is to be done? On the basis of my own analysis and findings, we know what a genocide, the consequence of a genocide is an international obligation exists under international law to investigate, prosecute, and punish genocide. It's there. That's why when the Russians went into Ukraine, there was already a lot of noise. Remember my friend Karim, who's the international criminal prosecutor, the, the new one, uh, Karim Khan, he went straight. You remember, he went and started investigating the, the case. Uh, uh, and uh, because and then remember what Russia used as the excuse to invade Ukraine. Remember that Ukraine is committing genocide yeah. on the people, on the Russian uh, ethnic uh, Russian nationalities in, in Luhansk and Donetsk. So you begin to understand how genocide is a very important, necessary crime that is prohibited. So my, my own perspective is if, if an international crime is committed, international justice must follow. So same thing with crimes against humanity. When they are committed, there is an international obligation to prosecute them, to investigate them and to punish them. Same thing with war crimes. So the question then is, what are the prospects of such ever happening with respect to Kukraundi? Many have argued that, oh, why can't they go to the ICC? They can't go to the ICC for the simple reason that the ICC jurisdiction is limited. It's limited by a number of factors. It's limited by the fact that for you to be subjected to the ICC, you must be a state, a member state of the Rome Treaty. The ICC, uh, um, you know, the International Criminal Court uh, Statute. Zimbabwe isn't. It signed, but it never ratified it. So you can't subject a national of Zimbabwe or anybody that anything that happened in Zimbabwe to that. There's another, there's another challenge with using the ICC. The ICC jurisdiction is only valid from the day it came into force. Kukura only happened before, so it wouldn't work. Uh, there are many other constraints to the ICC exercising jurisdiction. There are ways in which the ICC can exercise jurisdiction through the back door if a case is referred to, to it by the security Council, the UN Security Council, which is highly unlikely that they would be referring a, something that happened in 1983 when they can't even refer something that happened in, in, in last year in Gaza when the Israelis were bombing the, the Palestinians or when they haven't even referred Yemen for Christ's sake and they haven't referred Syria for Christ's sake. You know, they, so the world order is in disarray. We can accept this. Uh, so, so, so the ICC is out. But the ICC is not the only way to hold 
perpetrators to account. And it hasn't been the only way through which people have always been held to account. In the former Yugoslavia, an ad, an ad hoc tribunal was established. You know, ad hoc simply means it's just, uh, uh, you know, it's decided there and there. Uh, an ad hoc tribunal was established in Rwanda. An ad hoc tribunal was established in, uh, in, in Cambodia. And some of these tribunals are hybrid. They are both national and international. And my own view is that for Kukraundi, if we follow the logic of Kukraundi being international crimes, what you would need is a tribunal of some sort to try these crimes. It was a crime, right? We, was a crime is a crime. So I'll, I'll go on to the question of perpetrators of these crimes. Who are the perpetrators of the crimes? How do you determine perpetration? Who? I also look at that as well. But 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 ultimately, once you once you draw the conclusion that an international crime is an international crime has been committed, you must then you must then ho hold to account people who perpetrate it. So ICC is out, but it doesn't mean it's out out out. Because remember what happened in, and I'll give you a classic example, that crimes just don't die. Hissène Habre, former president of Chad, committed terrible atrocities in his country. He was eventually overthrown, I think by Idris Deby, ran away and hid in Senegal. A lot of pressure from victims over the years. 30, 40 years later, he was tried. He was already in his 80s, 90s. He was tried in Senegal by a court established by the African Union with some international judges, some Senegalese judges, and victims, his victims coming from charge to testify. It was an odd, unusual uh, way. It was also a, an unprecedented uh, step by Africa, taking charge of its own, its own accountability without any international. Because Africa has always said, no, no, you don't, we, don't, we don't like the ICC, we don't. That, that's what they say, even though they are the ones that have been sending their own people to the ICC. But it's fine. We also understand the challenges and the politics that are there with the ICC. I mean, we're not all just saying, take our people to the ICC. I mean, we're Africans. We also have to find ways of... Of, 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 of localizing our own justice systems, uh, but also it has to be meaningful, not whitewashing it. So the Africans did something unprecedented with the Saint Habre, which was beautiful and to be applauded. And there's something to be looked at carefully there, whether there are lessons. Of course, he was no longer in power. It made it <laughs> easy. It always makes it easy when someone is no longer in power. Uh, and he, you know, it was convenient. There was no political uh, um, fallout of them doing that to him. Uh, so they did that. In other countries, in Sierra Leone, after the, the conflict there, they combined uh, the methods, bringing some international judges and local judges, and created a hybrid court, the Special Court for Sierra Leone, which was a hybrid tribunal with a mix of international and local. The same thing happened where I, I worked in Timor, where I defended the, the commanders that I talked talk to you about in Timor. It was again a hybrid with a mix of international judges and local judges, international prosecutors, local prosecutors, international lawyers, defense lawyers and local. And I was one of the international defense lawyers there defending these militia commanders. Um, so that's one way. Same thing in Cambodia the extraordinary chamber. Uh, and mind you, the Cambodian tribunal again took place 30, 40 years after Pol Pot's Khmer Rouge regime had. And by the time they were trying the people like Douche for some of the atrocities, Douche was over, over 90 years old. They were almost dead, these people. They were still, they tried them. They tried them and they convicted them. So that's one, that one possibility. It doesn't need the ICC. But it's, it's a looming prospect because a crime has been committed and there has been no account. So when you're looking at what needs to be done, whether it's 10 years later, 15, 20, 30, 40 years later, like I said with Habre, the prospect of justice requires that you explore accountability in this way. Um, and that's one possibility.